Roy Stewart, hello. Hello. On this fine day after polling day, how are you feeling? Boris Johnson, landslide majority. Uh, f f feeling a bit like your um, your plant here. <laughs> plastic. <laughs> slightly, sli slightly plastic, slightly decrepit. Slightly yeah. Plastic. I mean, uh, Easy. <laughs> so, yeah. To begin with, I, I guess um, I, I was astonished. I didn't think he was going to win that bigger majority. Uh, in fact, I probably thought he was going to, you know, best get a very small majority. The um, second thing I think is that it's very worrying because people may well think this is the way you've got to do politics. You've got to have a three-word slogan. You've got to just keep hammering it. And it, in a sense, it doesn't matter how outrageous you are. You don't apologize. It doesn't matter what you do in the campaign. As long as you keep hammering away, you'll win. I think that's a bit dangerous for democracy because um, politics can't really be about three words, can't really be about three words like selling a can of baked beans. It's got to be about the details of how you do things. So I'm hoping people understand that, in a way, this was really a Brexit election. And it was an election about the fact that people were worried about Jeremy Corbyn. But I'm praying people don't take the lesson from this, that this is the way we do British politics in the future. Could you put some historical contextual shape on this? Because a majority, I think it's 80 now, the last seat's gone. It's a 80-seat it's a 80, 80 majority for, for Boris Johnson. We're sort of looking at maybe a, a decade, really, aren't we, of Tory government now. It's very rare, perhaps, for a majority of that size to be turned over in a single parliamentary cycle, isn't it? It's, it's completely extraordinary. I mean, and of course, generally speaking, in British politics, we don't expect governments to serve more than a couple of terms. So I came into politics in 2010, and the story was, you'll be lucky if you get a couple of terms in government. And then the British public, like any public, like change. It doesn't matter how good you are. You run out of ideas, you get a bit stale, they kick you out. So I think people would have thought that even had Boris won, you know, he would continue for a few more years, but the Tories were beginning to feel tired. What the odd thing he's achieved is he's produced the possibility that maybe this is the beginning couple of terms, and that would be very strange because that's never happened in British politics. On the sort of that point you've just made, last 10 elections, Labour have only won three of them. They've lost seven, and those three were with Tony Blair. Do you think there's any appetite for well, socialism, a left-wing Labour Party, or do you think really their only prospect of a successful electoral contest is from the centre? I think they have to move back to the centre. I'm afraid they've followed the same mistake that uh, was made in France, made in Italy. Maybe it's being made by some of these candidates in the US. But the European parties, the, the big equivalents to the Labour parties in those countries, went too left-wing, and they ended up as small, narrow parties for intellectuals and cities and they lost their base, often lost their base, I'm afraid, in places like France to far-right parties. And the Labour Party was the last real broad-based left-wing party in Europe. And I'm afraid under Jeremy Corbyn, they went down a very, very difficult path, and it's going to be difficult for them to come back now. So a lot of this will be these 500,000 members. Famously, he's got these 500,000 members. They are people who agreed with his policy, and the question will be, are they going to be willing to take the risk of coming back to the centre ground? Because there is a territory there, which is the territory of somebody like me or David Miliband, which is the centre of British politics. But these parties at the moment are not very interested in them. That leaves this gaping hole in the centre. We'll come back to the centre ground, but I'd just like to touch on, I might even call it the morality of this election, because it's sort of, it's become quite Americanised, I think, in what we've seen with Donald Trump, it's sort of become a bit of a culture war. This attitude among Corbyn supporters that basically if if you vote for the Conservative Party, you know, you're 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 a you're a traitor, you've betrayed the working class, you know, this attitude that the Conservative Party are they say it, they call they call them scum, you know. It's and they've really taken this holier than thou approach to it. And I also want to know if there's some serious there must be some serious feelings of regret because how can they do anything other than look at themselves in the mirror and say, we have let down our constituents? If that's what they think, if they, if they think that voting Tory is, you know, such a, such a horrendous thing for their constituents and the way that they've campaigned, they've got behind this leader who's brought them this colossal defeat, they've got to be looking at themselves in the mirror and feeling pretty bad this morning, surely. It's very difficult, isn't it? Because I think partly because of social media, we are all increasingly in little echo chambers where we talk to people who agree with ourselves. So... Somebody who thinks the Tories are scum will be talking all the time to other people who think the Tories are scum, and they'll convince themselves everybody in the world thinks the Tories are scum, and then they will wake up in the morning and be astonished to discover that there is a huge swathe of the British population that just is not that angry. It's not that ideological. And 
I think this is a good thing because politics shouldn't, in the end, be about us against them, shouldn't be about feeling the other person is evil. It should be about trying to accept that most of us want to work together, most of us have an idea of the world, and it's not actually that the other side is evil. And I think that one of the things that maybe underlay this is when I started 10 years ago, there were a lot of people who used to say to me, politics is so boring, you know, all these people agree, Blair, Brown, Cameron, what's going on? And I remember my constituents saying, oh, I remember the good old days, you know, late 70s, early 80s, you know, Tony Benn. And, I, and now we look at this and I think, God, how lucky we were. I mean, what is it they were going for? They, I remember somebody saying to me, you know, these titans, you know, Tony Benn, Enoch Powell, those were the days, at least they believed in something. And I thought, whoa, 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 whoa. And now we're back at this world where it's as though the thing, as though at some level, people just wanted excitement, they wanted fun, they wanted... But actually, this is uh, running a country is like running anything. It's like running a business or a family. It's actually about looking at detail. It's about caring about people. It's about working hard. It's not about big slogans. It's interesting to hear you say that and make the case for this, this centre ground in our politics because the fact remains that Boris Johnson has won a huge landslide victory now. You know, I interviewed James Cleverly the other day. He was open to me about the fact that he describes himself as a Thatcherite. We've got other Thatcherites, prominent people who wrote Britannia Unchained in the cabinet. You know, this is... He may, he may say it's a one-nation Tory party, but he's kicked out most of the one-nation Tories, and it's pretty right-wing, you being, you being a case of that. If you're making a play for the centre, how can you be relevant if the electorate goes for this kind of politics? What's, what's your play? What's your offering? The play is to start from the bottom up to start with cities. So I think everywhere in the world, uh, Italy, America, the United States, the center ground rebuilds itself from cities because cities are where you need to be very practical and concrete. You can't afford to be ideological. You've got to make the tubes run on time. You've got to make sure that people feel safe. You've got to pick up, pick up the rubbish. And that's why actually often mayors find that role very satisfying, but it's also why often mayors are moderate, practical, centre-ground politicians, because you can't afford to be ideological about when you pick up the bins. You've just got to pick up the bins. And I think that the only hope for British politics is for us, if I'm lucky enough to be Mayor of London, to work with people like Andy Burnham in Manchester, uh, to work with the Mayor of Birmingham, and together really begin to get a sense, well, these people, Andy Street, Andy Burnham, myself and others, that we can do things. The centre ground has to be exciting again. It has to be passionate again. The, the problem, honestly, even reflecting on talking to you, is that it's too easy for someone like me to end up talking in a very kind of measured, calm voice, which allows the other guys to be kind of energetic, passionate. Like, right, right. We've got to get a bit of passion back into the centre ground. We've got to get angry about things. We've got to talk about change if we're to win this. Otherwise, the devil has all the best tunes. What are you angry about then? I'm angry about safety. I started being angry about safety as the prisons minister when I walked into prisons and I saw all the broken windows and I found that violence had tripled in five years. I'm angry about safety in London because I think we can do much, much better. And I know other cities have done better and I feel that that is the first thing you do, that we've taken our eyes off the basics, that unless people feel safe, unless their children feel safe at school, you can't do all the other wonderful things you need to do with this great city. So I think that's, that's where it begins. But I'm also, at some level, impatient about standards. I think I'd love, if I had the privilege to help people in the city, to feel that it's like running a great hotel. You've got to stay on top of things all the time. You've got to, it's not just about the reception of the flowers, it's about the dirty sheets, it's about the cockroaches in the kitchen, it's about being out day after day, keeping the whole thing going. And I think that's the kind of country we are, but it's not the kind of politics we have. There's one other thing from the general election that I would read into and probably put to you as, a, I think, a bit of a challenge for you, and that's this mayoral contest, you're going up a Labour in, against a Labour incumbent. Pretty much the only place in the whole country that the Labour vote held up was in London. You've got a bit of a mountain to climb, haven't you? I have a big mountain to climb. But what I would say is that the great strength of being an independent, in a way that you can't, if you are a Labour or Conservative politician, 
is that you challenge the central government for London when you need to, and you're polite to the central government for London when you need to. The problem with these parties is if you're a Tory, you have to fall over backwards agreeing with the central government all the time. If you're Labour, you just can't collaborate. You can't work together. I found this even when I was working with the Mayor of London when I was in government. Very, very reluctant to work together with government. It doesn't want to give the government the credit, thinking about political angles. The great thing about an independent is it works for a city. It allows you to say, I do not care about the politics. All I care about is sorting this thing out for London. What do you need me to do? How much money can you give me? What can we do? How do we do this together? Just finally, something else that you and I have spoken about before. It's forgiveness and apology and the need for particularly people in public life to be perhaps more forthcoming with an apology. Do you think that Jeremy Corbyn owes an apology to certain people? Do you think he's let people down in the way that he's campaigned in this election? It's very difficult to know. I mean, I think as a, as a leader, when you lose, uh, you, you, you do need to apologise. I also think that it's very difficult for him because these beliefs, which are quite minority beliefs we now discover, are things that he's held for probably seven, 60 years of his life. I think he... You know, I, I profoundly disagree with him, his view of the world, but I think that he's a sincere man. I think these are things that he holds. So I think he will bring himself, I hope, to apologise for having let down his party and let them down in the fight against the things that he profoundly disagrees with. But I suspect you won't find him apologising for his beliefs because these are his. They're not something he's focus grouped. He, he's wrong, but he's, he's sincere in being wrong. Rory Stewart, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.